Okay, so now we're going to have a look at knowledge. Before we looked at how to keep coal in the ground, now we're going to have a look at knowledge, and in particular, knowledge spillovers. So, we're interested in this part of the course about where there are multiple market failures, right? So, with the keeping coal in the ground and the harsh dud paper, it's all about the free riding incentives with multiple jurisdictions and uh, sort of externalities between countries, if you like. Here the problem is the positive externality from investment in knowledge, R&D, research and development. Surely that positive externality is a good thing. Well, it is. But the problem is here's me and I'm thinking of doing some research and I know that that research will help me if I come up with something it'll help me make profits for a while. Okay, but then time passes and soon my discovery is outdated. It's been superseded by other people's discoveries. Okay. So I'm not making any profits anymore. Fine. What's the problem with that? The problem is that these people are standing on my shoulders. They are using my discovery, they used it to help them make their discoveries. So then my, the benefit of my discovery is carrying on through the generations in that it helps to further knowledge which then helps the further furthering of knowledge and so on. The more people who are going to end up standing on my shoulders the bigger the social benefit of my original work and the bigger discrepancy, the discrepancy between my incentives to do that work at, and how the social planner would see it. The social planner looks at this and thinks, wow, get on with it. And I look at this and think, I'm only interested, if I'm a rational economic man anyway, I'm only interested in what I can get out of it in this period, which is much less. So therefore, in a laissez-faire, research is undersupplied. Okay. Research tends to be undersupplied in laissez-faire. And what we're going to see in particular is but it's especially undersupplied in growing sectors. Because if you've got a growing sector, the situation looks like this. If you've got a shrinking sector with lots of people doing fossil research now, but in future nobody's going to care about fossil fuels, then the ratio of the social benefit to my benefit is much smaller this positive spillovers are smaller, the undersupply of research is smaller. Okay, so the climate, the, sp the special problem for climate policy is that it's research into green energy, renewable energy, climate solutions tends to be especially severely undersupplied. So we need to account for that in our policy. The first paper we're going to look at, which kind of has to do with this subject, is the paper by Fisher and Newell from 2008, which is a very, very, I mean, it's a solid 
paper, but it's it's very simple paper. Okay, it's not really getting to grips with this kind of issue. Okay, let me pause there and think about what I want to say next. Okay, so what do Fisher and Newell do? The first page of their paper, they basically build a model with a climate externality and with these two alternative energy sources like fossil and clean, and then they say, look, to get clean energy cheaper, we need to do research, and there's these spillovers on the research that the, the original researcher can't capture all the benefits, but they just have a really simple arbitrary model of that spillover. But they also say that to bring the costs down, we also have learning by doing, okay, that as you make more solar panels, for instance, making solar panels gets cheaper. And that also means that the pioneer maker of solar panels, kind of, bar uh, Norweg, what's that in English? <laughs> kind of makes the way, prepares the way for the followers and makes things cheaper for them. So again, that's an externality, a positive externality. And people will be reluctant to take the first step because that's when the costs are highest. And these things need to be dealt with in a policy context. Okay, sip of tea later. How would you deal with these in a policy context? So in the Fisher and Newell model, there's a, you can get to first best. Okay, quite straightforwardly, you need three policies. You need the tax on emissions, a Pigovian tax, as always, in first best. But you also need a research subsidy to compensate for the fact that this guy is not capturing all the benefits. And you also need a subsidy to account for the early stage production of renewable energy to account for the learning by doing. And if you do all three, then you get first best. And then what Fisher and New will do is say, well, let's just pretend that for some reason the regulator can only choose one instrument. Which would the regulator choose? Okay. And hardly surprisingly, they find that the best one to choose is to price emissions, to go for emissions. And the best option to go for emissions is to price emissions. The next best is to have a performance standard, which I guess I can't quite remember now, but it's going to be some kind of technology standard, like you have to sort out your technology and have green technology. Again, it's going straight for emissions. You can tax power from fossil fuels, if you only had one fossil fuel, that would be the same as an emissions tax. But if you have multiple fossil fuels, then you won't be disfavoring coal enough, because coal is dirtier than the other fossil fuels. It's going to be pretty good, but not as good as Pigou. Then you can start like targeting renewables and saying, look, you have to use some renewables. We'll pay you to use renewables. It's not as good as going after the fossil fuels. Okay, and finally, you can subsidize R&D. Why is that so rubbish compared to these other ones? It's basically because you don't get any effect initially. The payback only comes later. And why... Basically, pricing emissions is like alpha and omega, R O, as the Swedes say. Well, maybe not omega, but whatever letter comes before omega. Pricing emissions is the fundamental way to get towards first best. Sorting out the knowledge spillovers and so on is secondary. Okay. I'm going to pause there and I'm going to flick and we're going to have a quick look at some of the equations in the model before I leave this paper. 
Okay, so on page 145, we've got energy supply to the economy is made either from the fossil sector, we've got made coal and natural gas in a nice, linear, sensible production function. And then on the renewable side, page 146, we've got a cost function for renewables and costs are declining in the knowledge in the renewable sector, but they're increasing in renewable production at the given time. So basically, you've got different quality of resources, you've got a place where it's really easy to make a dam and you can have lots of hydro cheaply, but then if you want more renewables, it's trickier, you need to build a dam somewhere else, you need to start with wind, you need to start with solar, you have to go to more and more expensive options. Okay, and the knowledge stock, K, which reduces costs, is a function of cumulative knowledge from R&D and cumulative experience from learning by doing big Q. And I guess Q is the integral of little Q. Uh, or it's the sum, I can't remember if this is periods. Yeah. The big Q is going to be linked to the little Q's period by period. Okay, and you don't really need to be a rocket science to work out what's going to a rocket scientist to work out what's going to happen here. Okay, if you apply instruments to sort out each of these three problems, the um, well, I didn't mention the first problem, but the emissions from the fossil fuels is the first problem, damaging emissions. Second problem is the spillovers from R and D. Okay, I haven't actually explained the spillovers from R&D either, have I? But basically, let me see. I think at least one place where they talk about the spillovers from R&D is bottom of page 147. Appropriation rates are imperfect. Rho is less than 1. Firms have insufficient incentive to engage in extra production for the purpose of learning by doing. Sorry, that's learning by doing. And spillovers, if they're not captured, then firms have insufficient incentive to invest in R&D as well. Okay, so how do we sort all this out? Well, you correct the spillovers with three, you're gonna, you've got three problems and you're going to need three instruments, the Picobian tax, one to correct for the knowledge spillovers and one to correct for the learning by doing spillovers. But what if you only subsidize R&D, basically? You're really going to be struggling against the tide, aren't you? Because Presumably, fossil is basically cheaper than renewables. Otherwise, why are we using all this fossil and hardly any renewables? So R&D isn't really going to help much unless you can bring the renewable price below the fossil price. And that's going to be really tough if fossils aren't handicapped by Pigovian taxes. Yeah. So... The fundamental thing is to bring the price of fossil fuels up, especially coal, which is the most damaging fuel, through a Pigovian tax. And then, over the long run, bringing the price of renewables down more by helping research along the way with a bit of research subsidy is going to make things even better. Okay, that's basically what comes out of this paper. Okay. And they build up this model and they simulate it. But really, what I've gone through is the fundamentals of this paper. So I'm going to stop there.